on Christmas Day when I was in the second grade, my family packed into our 1978 Ford Super Cab pickup truck for a three-week road trip across the United States. All eight of us. In a lot of these ways, that was my very first expedition, albeit less public and a lot less glamorous than future expeditions, but it was significant because it was my first chance to really see that the world was so much more than our modest home in rural Minnesota in a town of less than 100 people. We saw some amazing things that opened my eyes for the first time. The Rocky Mountains, the Grand Canyon, the Ozarks. We even crossed the border into Mexico. I saw people that were different than me. I experienced new cultures and new ways of thinking. And my brothers and sisters were so excited and did not want to mess it up, so we all got along. Coincidentally, or maybe not, my dream of becoming an astronaut started about that same time. I don't remember the exact moment, but I do know that in 1978, NASA selected the first female astronauts. And this new vehicle called the Space Shuttle was in development. And I think that those things, along with that trip with my family, really planted that astronaut seed in my head. Little did I know at the time, the dream would actually come true, and that trip across the country crammed in a pickup truck with seven other people would be some great preparation for astronaut expeditionary training that I would later receive. <laughs> it was also the first huge expansion of my worldview. It wasn't until later that I recognized, in order, in order for me to grow personally, I needed to dare to get out of my comfort zone and expand those boundaries. Now it's 30 years later, and I'm on Space Shuttle Discovery with six crewmates. We're approaching the International Space Station. We have the 17-ton Japanese laboratory in our payload bay, and we're there to install it and activate it. My hair is in a tight zero-G bun so it doesn't splay all over so that others can get a peek out of the window where I'm stationed. Our commander, Mark Kelly, is piloting Discovery, making very small corrections to keep us on the right orbital path, and I'm there helping him by monitoring our closing rates and some other things. Us on the space shuttle and the space station are both traveling 17,500 miles per hour, 250 miles above the surface of Earth. But we're closing ever so slowly from the front of space station. As we get closer and the space station gets bigger in our view, I see just how bright and shiny it is. And I think, wow, this is the most beautiful human-made thing I have ever seen. And it's just hanging there in the blackness of space. I get goosebumps. I've been familiar with Space Station for a long time, but not until right now, when I see it from the aft, flat de aft flight deck of Space Shuttle Discovery with my own eyes, do I fully appreciate and understand the magnitude of it. And not just the size, because it's admittedly huge, but the magnitude of what humanity has accomplished. Thousands of people from around the world working together toward a common goal with a common purpose as a team to make it happen. As we continue our approach, I catch my breath as I realize for the next two weeks, everything that my crew and I need to survive is on that spaceship. The air we will breathe, the water we will drink, the food we will eat. Here in space, our very lives depend on the integrity and health of that spaceship and on each other. My second trip to space, about five years later, would be returning to the International Space Station that I've grown to love, but this time I wouldn't arrive on the space shuttle. I would arrive on a Russian Soyuz, and I'd be staying there for five and a half months. Most of the time on station, we live in shorts, maybe pants, t-shirt, polo shirt, but sometimes we need to get suited up in the big, white, bulky spacesuit, which is really a spacecraft of its own and leave the protection of space station to repair and replace equipment outside. It is one of the riskiest things that we do. I was reminded of that on July 16th, 2013. My crewmates, Chris, a Navy SEAL, and Luca, an Italian Air Force pilot, were going out on a spacewalk. My job was to choreograph the suit-up process, get them in the airlock, and then run the procedures to depressurize the airlock to match the vacuum of space. Once Chris and Luca were outside and going about their work, my job was done there until about six or seven hours later when the spacewalk ended. 
As I was going about some other work on Space Station, I heard Luke a comment over the big communication loop about having water in his helmet. And at first it didn't sound very bad, just a nuisance for him. But after an amount of time, it became apparent that the situation was far worse than anybody could have anticipated. Luca had water all over his head. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> A frog. <laughs> Luca had water all over his head. His communication was getting weaker as water had gotten into the electronics of his comm cap. He had water in his ears, water covering his eyes, water was going up his nose. And ironically, it seemed that he was in danger of actually drowning in outer space. Houston made the call to end the spacewalk, get them back inside as quickly as possible. And of course, as soon as they heard this, our three Russian crewmates stopped what they were doing and rushed to the airlock to be of assistance. When Chris and Luca were back in the airlock and the hatch was closed to the outside, I turned the valve to start the process of slowly adding air back into the airlock. It is a slow process, but what was minutes now seemed like an eternity. Luca had stopped responding to us, and I was sure he was drowning. My hand was just about to turn the valve to the emergency setting, in which case the pressure would have increased so quickly that Luca and Chris's eardrums would have burst. But then Chris said, Luca squeezed my hand, he's still okay. <laughs> Sigh. <laughs> Once the airlock was fully pressurized, Fyodor jumped in to open the hatch. We pulled Luca out and performed the expedited suit doffing procedure. In other words, we didn't worry about the finer points. We just got his helmet off quickly and safely. Pavel was there with towels he had collected from his, on his way from the Russian segment to catch the water that floated away and to wipe the water off Luca's head. As you can imagine, Luca was visibly relieved. We all were. He had kept his cool remarkably that day, and what could have been a tragedy ended well. So that day, when Luca's personal little spaceship failed him by allowing water to infiltrate the ventilation system, his entire crew on board, the entire team on the ground, without a second of hesitation, were there to save him, because that's what we do for our teammates. In total, I've spent 180 days in space. 14 days on my first mission and 166 on my second. And I can say without question that the number one thing I enjoyed about it when I look back at is looking back at planet Earth. I first got to see places like the Rocky Mountains and the Grand Canyon and the Ozarks and even a glimpse of Mexico with my family on that trip in the pickup truck. And if those experiences opened my mind, then seeing those places and the entire rest of Earth from orbit totally blew my mind. And that border that we crossed into Mexico, that isn't something you can see from space. And it's very clear at 250 miles up that Earth is a lone oasis just hanging there in the blackness of space. And that's one of the most profound experiences I had as an astronaut. And it seems to be the most profound experience that anybody who goes into space has. Looking back at Earth, our shared home, our shared life support system, our shared spacecraft, if you will. So when we're on the space station, we like to spend as much time as we can in the cupola. Seven windows facing down toward Earth with a magnificent 360 degree view. I recall flying over upstate New York when I was there, when my son Jack, who was three at the time, was visiting my in-laws at, the, in, um, at their home in upstate New York. As we crossed over that area, I looked down and I focused at the exact spot where he was, and so many thoughts went through my head. Jack is right there. I can feel him. I wonder what he's doing. Is he having fun? Has he been sleeping enough? Is he happy? Does he miss me? And then I noticed myself doing that, going over other parts of Earth, Central Africa, the cities in Europe, Western Asia, Australia. I would look down and look at an exact spot on Earth and focus at that and ask myself, I wonder who is right there. Are there any little boys my son's age? Are they happy? 
Are they hurting? Are both of their parents with them? All of us on earth have so much more in common than we do different. We are all connected and we are all on the same team. <clears throat> Recently, as I hung up my spacesuit and retired from NASA, I realized I am going to live out the rest of my life on Earth. And that made me focus on my spaceship and my crewmates, Earth and all of you. As astronauts, when we're on a mission, we are well aware that the integrity and health of our spaceship needs to be maintained for our very lives. And we know that it is our job to do that. And as the crew on board, we know that we must have each other's backs no matter where we come from or who we are. In all my time in space, looking down at Earth and working with my team, I realized it's just like that here on Earth too. It might not be as easy to see until you get into orbit and see it with your own eyes. And I'm so glad that through my life, I took some risks, I got out of my comfort zone, and I had the opportunity to do that. So you might be wondering, what is the number one thing that I discovered of importance from my time in space? It is very simply the importance of Earth. There's nothing like it. We need to cherish it, and we need to conserve it. The International Space Station has been in orbit now for over 20 years, constantly inhabited by human beings. It's an unfathomable achievement that took unprecedented teamwork. It's going to take that teamwork to keep ISS going. And it is going to take that same level of teamwork to keep Earth healthy and habitable for a long, long time. My son Jack is 11 now, and I'm concerned about the world that we are handing down to him and his crewmates. So let's together leave a legacy for the next generations that we can all be proud of. Thank you.